sit at the very pinnacle of British society. The first family, but with no political power, how we see them and what we think about them is critical to the whole institution they represent. The royal family relies upon publicity and uh, popularity as its oxygen for survival. I think they've got unbelievable privilege and that comes at a cost and the cost is of course they're always in this electronic goldfish bowl. Nothing can prepare you for what it's like to work for the royal family. They are the policy, they are the brand, they are flesh and blood. If the media were not interested in the royal family, the monarchy would be in serious trouble. And yet there was a time when that relationship went spectacularly wrong. So much so that Prince Charles needed the help of a spin doctor to rebuild his battered image. Charles knew virtually nothing about media relations. And now the younger royals, William, Harry and Kate, are locked in their own power struggle with the press. There were some paparazzi there and they were shouting, slag! Poor bitch, look this way. They viewed the press as this unmanageable beast, trying to get into every aspect of their lives. Every single mobile phone has got a camera on it now. I don't believe there is any such thing as private life anymore. But for the heir to the throne, it's now not so much his private life as his personal views that are under the media microscope. This is a prince who has a voice, wants to continue to have a voice, maybe when he's king. But will Britain tolerate an outspoken monarch? I just don't know. As the Queen gets older, succession beckons and heirs stand in line. So public interest in the royal family will intensify, which means their relationship with the media, so often strained, really has never been more important. This is the story of a decades-long battle over personal privacy and public image between the first family and the fourth estate, the monarchy and the media. <laughs> Prince William and Prince Harry have had to grow up in the media spotlight. Their family life subjected to truly extraordinary levels of public scrutiny. Well, I remember William's first day at Weatherby School. Diana said, now listen, William, when we get there, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of the press, and you know, must behave yourself, because you want to get this for the rest of your life. And he's sort of just like that Just William character. He sort of put his head down and says, I don't like photographers. When William and Harry's parents' marriage broke down, it happened in the most public and bitterly personal way imaginable. Press attention could not have been more intense. And even when Princess Diana died in a Paris underpass, she was being pursued by paparazzi press photographers. William and Harry were very angry. They basically viewed the media as having hounded their mother to death. I don't mean they vaguely thought, they actually specifically thought that is what had happened. There was a huge degree of anger and hostility. Because of that awful thing that happened in 97, we had to deal with William and Harry in a completely different way maybe than royal children had been dealt with before. How do we allow these two young men to grow up in the way that they have, um, knowing that the slightest mistake, the all teenage boy that isn't going to be featured on the front page of a newspaper. Do you think they might have been overprotected? Possibly. In, certainly in the first couple of years after their mother died. But I think that was a normal human reaction. The media beast had been tamed by a series of deals which covered the princes whilst they were at school. But now William was about to turn 18, he would potentially be exposed for the first time to the unrestricted attentions of the press. He was due to embark on a gap year trip, the details of which had been kept secret. Good morning, when are you planning to leave? Um, quite soon. Um, I, I can't really say, but it's, it's soon. The question was, would the press play ball? Lord Wakeham, who had brokered the original school deal, proposed a solution. I said to him, my guess is there are ten newspaper editors 
who know you're going to get you know, the plan for you to go on a gap year. They don't know where you're going, and they are spending resources to try and find out. Somebody will find out. That newspaper editor has got an exclusive. It's a good bully for him. But I said, there's another nine newspaper editors who all spent money trying to get this story who will be pretty fed up with you. So what I suggest to you is to do a deal. And so another deal was done to cover Prince William's ten weeks of volunteer work in a remote part of Chile. Accompanying a reluctant William for a short part of his trip would be just one journalist, one photographer and one TV cameraman. There was a very low level of expectation from both ITN and the palace. This is William's time out. Um, I don't think he was overly keen with the idea. We're expecting very little. So anything you get's a bonus. Basically, it's the same every day. It's porridge and muesli. Ah. Marigold's are now officially a fashion item. <laughs> he was obviously enjoying himself there. He was enjoying being able to do what he wanted to do, interact with people in a very normal way. Hello, you group jets out there. Uh, this is uh, Total Love. There's no press officers, uh, no press office contact whatsoever. It was just us. I think he felt at ease, and that's what I suggested to him. I said, look, rather than somebody else who's not here talking about what you're doing here, why don't you say it for yourself? And that is how Prince William, the future king, came to do his first ever sit-down TV interview, unscheduled and unplanned. I'd set the camera up remotely behind me, and as nervous as I am now talking to you, he must have been in front of my camera. <laughs> I love being, having no restrictions, you know. There's no one out here chasing me around or anything, it's brilliant. You don't have any secrets here. And that's why I find it very difficult myself to start with, because I'm a very private person. And I still am a private person. It's, it's very difficult to get away from your own time. So that's one thing I had to learn to deal with. I think Chile was a completely unique experiment. To send a cameraman, virtually unescorted, down to a remote part of the world with the future king, and all that could possibly go wrong with that, especially a young man who's not up to speed with what he's supposed to say or not supposed to say, what he's supposed to do or not supposed to do. And if that had gone wrong, that would have taken an awful long time to fix. As a first significant step into the media spotlight, William's gap year was pretty successful. The ice had been broken, he hadn't put his foot in it, and the rest of the media had, by and large, played ball. William then went off to university, where he was protected by another agreement with the press to leave him alone in exchange for the occasional photo opportunity. So he, more or less, disappeared from view, which is more than can be said for his younger brother, Prince Harry. I knew him as a young boy. He was a bit of a rascal then, but a likeable rascal. School was a success for William, but not for Harry. He didn't really fit in very well at Eton. I'm not sure he was very happy there. You know, I think he was in a pretty bad place at the time. Harry had already got himself a bit of a reputation for misbehaving. And it was that narrative that stuck. In no time at all, the party prince was born. Over 18, out on the town, and unprotected by any deal with the press. Yes, he would get absolutely slaughtered in a, in a nightclub, rock out into the street at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Paparazzi would be there, cameras in his face. But you know, what would happen is the newspapers would have those shots from that one episode and they would use them in, the, in the, that week's papers but then they'd hang on to them and they'd, they'd chuck them into the paper a couple of weeks later, three weeks after that. So his behaviour is being exaggerated by the way the press Precisely. Was. They'd already written the narrative about Harry. He was the wild child, he was, he was off the rails, the complete antithesis of, of his goody-two-shoes brother. At the end of the day, he was only a teenager, had lost his mum at a very early age, was rebelling. You know, he wasn't the only one. Prince William was getting drunk quite a lot himself. Nobody seemed to report about that. So there was an image of the good prince and the bad prince, and, and Harry got labelled the bad prince. 
If the problem was Harry, as one senior courtier said to me, the solution was the army. But that wouldn't happen until he was 20, which meant the Royal Press Office faced nearly two years of Prince Harry as fair game for a hungry press pack. And the man who would have to deal with that was Prince Charles's new Director of Communications at Clarence House, Paddy Harveson, ex of the Financial Times and recently arrived from Manchester United. He had an absolutely straight-as-a-die attitude to public relations. He had no favourites. He made it very clear from the beginning that he was putting up with nothing. If the newspapers got it wrong, he would let them know. And it wasn't long before Harveson's no-nonsense approach would be tested in the shape of a particularly hostile article about Prince Harry in the Daily Express, penned by the columnist and self-confessed Wednesday witch, Carol Sala. Do you think you were, with hindsight, in any sense unfair to him? I mean, it's pretty trenchant. Prince Harry is a national disgrace. The drinking, the drugging, the yobbing, the explicit disdain for the lower orders. He has never once done anything because it was right and has rarely lifted a finger unless it's to feel up a cheap tart in a nightclub or shoot some harmless critter. <laughs> Did you know that it still is quoted back at me? <laughs> that, 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 is, that is pretty harsh. I think you describe it as a verbal bottom smacking. Yes. I knew the public would agree with this, but I did nevertheless expect next day's fish and chip wrapping. And that is what would have happened had not the palace seen fit to offer me the gift of a journalistic lifetime by fighting back. In an effort to put the record straight and to show some public support for his new client, Harveson wrote a letter condemning Sala's article as grossly unfair, ill-informed nonsense that showed no understanding of Prince Harry as a person. He also insisted that the Express publish it, which sent the story global. Harveson really should have shut up all around the world and there were more than 200 countries the headlines were along the lines of the palace has protested about this vile journalist it wasn't this vile journalist da, 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 da. i doubt very very much that i'd have made it as far as sydney or los angeles without paddy harvison's help in fact when sala's article was published prince harry and paddy harvison were already abroad on a trip that would work out much better for both of them. Harry was spending eight weeks of his gap year in the poverty-stricken African state of Lesotho. After all the unfavorable headlines about him in recent times, stories about yobbish behavior and visits to nightclubs, the prince now has a chance to show a more positive, a more serious side to his character. And one film crew from ITN stayed on to make a documentary about Harry's trip. <laughs> First couple of days, we had all these amazing shots. It was really lovely stuff. You know, you only have to work in telly for 10 seconds and think, oh, my God, this is telly gold. She couldn't even cry, could she? Mm, no. She couldn't cry. She didn't. She could barely be fed either. Yes, You know, he had this reputation as this sort of hard-living guy already, but here was a guy who seemed to me a bit vulnerable. The connection with the children and about whom he clearly did care a lot was in some way, you know, disadvantaged kids, his own personal kind of unhappiness did seem to be connected. What's all? Me. I think the suitor was a bit of a watershed moment. <laughs> the way he was with that child was very reminiscent of the Princess of Wales. It made me realise that, you know, this guy's got something special. But there was concern back at the Royal Press Office. I said, listen, yeah, we will definitely have to do an interview, you know, so let's do it. The palace was really nervous about him talking about Diana. You know, would Charles be upset? Would it be difficult? Would it raise the old ghost? I think Harry had a lot he wanted to get off his chest. We literally switched on the camera and blur out it all came. I've always wanted to do this. It's okay, it's completely, it's, it is what she was doing. What I started off again to Great Ormond Street and all this stuff, it was very, you know, I'm only 19 and there's a half of me, there's a lot of me that wants to say, right, it's now time to follow on or as much as I can, try and keep my mother's legacy going. I believe I've got a lot of my mother in me, basically. And I, 
I just, I just, I think she'd want us to do this, me and my brother. At the end of the day, Harry literally almost ran back to the car, almost, you know, and was absolutely a bully in the car because he really felt like a man who'd got something he wanted to say off his chest. And Harry kept up his commitment to Lesotho, founding a children's charity in memory of his mother, called Centre Bali, which translates from the local language as forget-me-not. William, meanwhile, remained largely hidden from view at university and protected from media intrusion whilst he was there. But not, it turned out, when he wasn't. The official annual photo call at Closters in March 2004 featured Prince William alongside his father. Harry was still in Lesotho. As usual, it was understood that after the photo call, the press would leave the royal party alone for the rest of their holiday. But it didn't take someone long to spot that William had company. A French paparazzi photographed William and Catherine on the, on the ski lift coming up together. The editor, Rebecca uh, Wade, as she was then, she had the pictures and she said, do you think they're an item? I said, yes, I do. And uh, she said, well, if we can prove that they're an item, we're running these pictures. By that end of that day, we stood it up that they were an item and she ran the pictures. By using paparazzi photos, the son had breached its agreement with the palace to leave the princes alone to enjoy their holiday. Paddy Harverson's response was swift and firm. Paddy Harverson decided that, you know, we were to be punished. And I remember the editor getting a letter saying, for the next uh, two photo calls, you will not be invited. And uh, the picture editor, sharp as a tack, said, get down to Buckingham Palace, do a picture outside. And uh, I think it was our Arthur's band or something. They were trying to play hardball and get serious about it, but because the editor didn't care. She's more interested in the story, and she was right. You know, this was a genuine story, because if someone's the girlfriend of, of a senior member of the royal family, they've every chance of being the wife, and you've got to cover that story. As second in line to the throne, William's private life had now become a matter of genuine public interest, something his father had also had to learn to live with. In fact, when the three princes gathered at Closters the following year, it was just weeks ahead of the wedding of Charles and Camilla. A rare appearance together and a last public appearance before this threesome becomes a foursome. The BBC's royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, had agreed his line of questioning the night before with Charles's communications director, Paddy Harverson. It's discussed, you know, BBC first question, so yeah, and I'll ask him about the wedding, of course I will, you know, um, uh, there's no point asking him about skiing, um, we're, we're news journalists, and the news at the time was the upcoming wedding. Clarence House invited reporters to ask questions, the royal wedding was one of the agreed topics, and the BBC went first. And then old Ginger Top, you know, steps forward and asks what on the face of it was possibly a fairly underarm question. Eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask you how you are feeling, how in particular Princes William and Harry are feeling at the prospect of the marriage? Very happy, very pleased. Be a good day. Prince Charles, how are you feeling? Well, it's a very nice thought, isn't it? I'm very glad you've heard of it anyway. We then went off to the little editing van and my cameraman colleague who'd been listening to all of this through headphones said to me, oh, I could hear some strange muttering and I think some swear words there. So we looked at the tape and lo and behold, there was what um, the Prince of Wales had said about me. Um, yes. <laughs> Bloody people. I can't bear that. So really Yes, very much so, definitely. As long as I don't lose the rings, I'm all right. I have to, would have to say it was a bit of a shock when I did uh, pick it up and we sort of re-spooled it and played it again. I can't bear that. So, so, bloody big. And with that, it was over. What Clarence House had hoped would be a positive PR moment prior to Prince Charles's wedding had turned into something of a PR disaster. I think what really angered Charles was me saying, and can I ask you, and in particular, William and Harry? Because that was, I, th I suspect, 
you know, we've never discussed it. I suspect that's what Charles took offence to, the idea of his sons being asked in his presence what they felt about his marriage to Camilla Parker Bowles. And, of course, William handled it yeah, very smoothly. He didn't give the answer that perhaps we'd been uh, expecting or, you know, that, that, that it, it was an opportunity lost. But, it, you know, it wasn't a problem. William handles those things, um, uh, you know, very easily. Right. Okay. All right. Right. Thanks very much, guys. Very good. Thank you very much for your help. That brief glimpse of what Prince Charles really felt that day in Closters might have been a little embarrassing. But what the prince really thinks about more important, not to say more political matters, has the capacity to be much more troublesome, even raising questions about his role as the future head of state. The Prince of Wales is said to regard himself as a political dissident who tries to influence opinion on some controversial issues. Those claims emerged on the opening day of a landmark case at the High Court. The case, heard in 2006, concerned a travel diary written by the Prince in 1997 at the handover of Hong Kong, which had been leaked to the press. In it, Charles had referred to China's leaders as appalling old waxworks. The reaction of Paddy Harbison and the palace was to sue the Mail on Sunday to prevent further publication. The palace knew that, in addition to this journal, we had um, seven others and they began a legal action for breach of confidence and um, breach of copyright. They insisted that they were his private thoughts, that they went to a small number of friends and that they were never intended for publication, they weren't intended to influence people, they were simply his private thoughts um, and therefore confidential. And you said? We said our understanding is they being given wide distribution anything up to 50, 75 people at a time, and that the people he sent them to would include politicians, opinion formers. The Prince has a long record of trying to influence politicians, and as such, the public have a right to know what he's doing and how he does it. The court found in favour of the Prince but the verdict was overshadowed by the evidence of Charles's own former spin doctor, Mark Boland, who had been called as a witness by the Mail on Sunday. In a sworn statement, he described just how far the Prince was apparently prepared to go to promote his political views. Mr Boland argues that at the time, for example, of President Jiang Zemin's state visit to Britain in 1999, the Prince of Wales wanted his critical views about the Chinese leadership to be made public. In his witness statement, which the palace argued should not be made public, Mark Boland said, I was given a direct and personal instruction by the Prince to draw to the media's attention his boycotting of the banquet. This I did, as he knew, by briefing the press, as did a number of his friends. Charles declined to attend a state banquet for an incoming Chinese premier visit, and it was made pretty clear that he did it because he disapproved of what was going on in Tibet. It caused a huge diplomatic storm at the time. Charles believes that's, that's part of his, his raison d'etre. These are things he can do as Prince of Wales. He was born to a position that gave him influence but no purpose, in the sense that he has a, he has a platform and he has a name. D does he want influence? And yes, because that is exactly what he has been doing with his whole life. The Prince's excursions into matters of public policy inevitably attracted media attention, not all of it welcome. Meanwhile, for the new generation, the main preoccupation was not political opinions, but personal privacy. In summer 2005, William was due to graduate from university, which would mark the end of the press agreement to leave him alone. I really do want to be in control of my own life, and having spent 22 years being in the spotlight, you don't really know much different. Um, but I, I value more than anything the, the normality that I can get. It's all about trust with William. He has a very tight circle of friends, and if anyone breaks that circle of trust, 
they're outside the circle. And William wanted to extend it, not just um, to his friends, but to the people who worked for him. Um, he had reason to believe that some of his father's staff, willingly or wittingly or unwittingly, had leaked information about him, um, which had appeared in, in the press, and he wanted to start, if you like, from a clean slate. The princes set up their own press operation separate from their father. But stories about William and Harry just kept on appearing. And it was one such, a throwaway tidbit in a gossip column, that kicked off what would become the most serious scandal to affect the British press since the death of Diana. <laughs> it all started with that programme Tom Bradby made for ITV about Prince Harry's gap year trip to Lesotho. Harry's quite an enthusiastic home movie maker, and um, we'll leave it at that. Straight up through there. To help Bradby make his documentary, Prince Harry had lent him all the tapes he'd shot that year. Two k's away from the One day I was sitting at home, and I spent, you know, a couple of hours editing him a funny video set to music of his... the, the unbroadcastable sections of his gap year. And when I next saw William, he said, oh, I love that video you did for Harry. And I said, well, it's, it's no skin off my nose, you know, I'll spend it if you want, I'll do one for you. And he said, yeah, that would be, do you know what, that would be really great. Any chance you have an hour on Monday night? I said, yeah, fine, could you please tell uh, Helen Asprey to leave your, my name on the gate? So this was like, from memory, it was sometime on a Saturday afternoon. So I didn't tell anyone about that, and there it was in the news of the world the next morning. Anyone reading the story might have presumed it was a leak from one of the princes in a circle. But the two people directly involved knew differently. William said to me, I, I know totally it wasn't you, but that is a bit weird, isn't it? How the hell did that get out? And I said, well, listen, when I first became Royal Correspondent, I was told that, you know, reporters quite regularly listened into each other's voice messages. I would be amazed if they're not still doing it. So if you left messages, and he said, well, yeah, I, funnily enough, I did. Well, I left a message with Helen. Alerted by William's suspicions, the police began an investigation and nine months later made their first arrests. It was the start of what became the phone hacking scandal. So when it became clear that they had been hacked and they were being hacked quite routinely, yeah. what was the reaction? I mean, my primary memory of that conversation with William was that it was like a light went on in his eyes, like, oh, yeah, oh, OK, oh, God, it all makes sense, you know. I think there was a very substantial degree of relief in that at last they could explain, you know. They'd mistrusted so many people in their circle over so many years. They'd had all these tests trying to catch people out, not their closest friends, but sort of people on the periphery, repeatedly trying to kind of work out who the hell was telling this stuff. And suddenly, well, there it all was. What were initially dismissed as the actions of one rogue reporter were eventually exposed as being widespread at the news of the world, and now we know going on elsewhere too. Phone hacking would in time prove to be a watershed for Britain's entire press establishment and one which would shift the balance of power decisively in the royals' favour. For the moment, though, it did look very much like business as usual. Kate Middleton made good copy for everybody, including people talking about people talking about Kate Middleton. Every day, Mobs of photographers were outside her house photographing her. Kate was coming through a gate at Heathrow, and the, there were some paparazzi there, and they were shouting, slag, whore, bitch, look this way. That's true. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Clarence House says it's greatly concerned by the hounding of Kate Middleton. They're hoping that the British press will impose a voluntary embargo on paparazzi photographs. She sort of existed in this slightly liminal world where she was of massive interest to people, but she didn't have any of the formal protections that the palace would give. The situation escalated on January the 9th, 2007, outside Kate's Chelsea flat. It was her 25th birthday, and speculation about a royal engagement was rife. I arrived here very early, 6 a.m., found a street littered with paparazzi photographers. Kate was a big story. There had been an agreement amongst the photographers and the broadcasters to stay this side of the street. 
unfortunately, the pack broke. A young woman being pursued by photographers. The shadow of Diana looms very large. Come on. Diana was thrown to the dogs as Charles's girlfriend and fiance. She had to completely fend for herself. They weren't going to allow that situation to happen again. William's privacy lawyers were employed, and it was made perfectly clear that they would not tolerate Kate Middleton being harassed in the way she had been. William made a promise to Michael Middleton when he first started dating Kate, I will protect her. And he has really been as good as his word. William now also had the European Court of Human Rights on his side. It had recently ruled that the right to privacy could still apply in a public place. And so the British press agreed not to buy any more paparazzi photos of Kate. The balance of power had shifted. Ten years on from her tragic death, there would be no rerun of the pursuit of Princess Diana. 2007 was a critical year for the royal family and Diana's legacy would loom large. Palace media managers were concerned that public reaction to the 10th anniversary of her death might rebound once again on Prince Charles. Their longer term strategy was to focus on TV, a more direct and generally controllable medium than the more troublesome press. First up, a Diana anniversary concert, designed to be owned by her two sons. No other senior members of the royal family were present. This evening is about all that our mother loved in life. Her music, her dance, her charities, and her family and friends. 2007 was also a big year for another British institution, the BBC. As well as the memorial concert, BBC television was the chosen home for two major access documentary projects featuring the Queen and Prince Charles. This represented quite a turnaround in relations between the corporation and the palace, which was still recovering from an interview shown on BBC One fully 12 years earlier, back in 1995. I was Panorama's editor at the time. Do you think you'll ever be queen? <sighs> no, I don't, no. Why do you think that? I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts, in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country. Royal liaison is a post within the BBC. During the time uh, that I had been uh, in that role, relations uh, had always been uh, extremely good. Uh, the, the system was working well. But when something of the nature of that particular documentary came along, it was evident that this was a fracture. This was uh, a different area. This was revelatory in a sense that previous celebratory documentaries about the monarchy uh, had been. This was not. Most serious of all was Diana's verdict on the critical issue of Prince Charles and succession. Do you think he would wish to be king? There was always conflict on that subject with him when we discussed it. And I understood that conflict because it's a very demanding role, being Prince of Wales, but it's equally a more demanding role, being king. And being Prince of Wales produces more freedom now, and being king would be a little bit more suffocating. And because I know the character, I would think that the top job, as I call it, would bring enormous limitations to him. And I don't know whether he could adapt to that. The palace were very upset. I mean, what they felt, I think, particularly was, we thought we had a, you know, you are the BBC. We didn't think you would do a thing like this. And then there was talk, well, we've been considering our relationship with the broadcasters. Um, and the BBC used to produce the Queen's Christmas broadcast and distribute it around the world. 
they said, well, we think that uh, you know, our relationship with the BBC ought to be some more like that with other broadcasters, and we think it's time for, we take it in turns now, three years for the BBC and three years for ITN to make the Queen's Christmas broadcast. So I said, not entirely seriously, but I sort of meant it, ah, I see, so you, you don't get mad, you get even then. The Diana interview caused real strain in the relationship between the BBC and the Palace. ITV went on to get not just the Christmas message, but the lion's share of royal access the BBC once took for granted. But by 2007, relations between the Corporation and Buckingham Palace were back on an even keel. That is, until the 11th of July that year, when the BBC held a press preview for its forthcoming autumn season. The highlight was a trailer for a five-part documentary series then titled A Year with the Queen. In a journalist's life, there are a few stories that they will definitely remember what happened on the day. And, you know, like all great stories, it sort of started with, with not much. But things livened up when the trailer cut to an encounter between the Queen and American photographer Annie Leibovitz. Could we try it without the crown? Just... It will look better, le less dressy, because the, the garter robe is so extraordinary. Less dressy? What do you think this is? <laughs> what I mean is, if you, ta if you take the, the crown off... At this point, the trailer cut to a shot of Her Majesty appearing to leave the room in a huff. So I'm not changing anything. I've done enough dressing like this. I and I just think, wow, this is fantastic. Annie Leibovitz has upset the Queen so much that she's storming out of her photo shoot on camera and muttering how she's fed up of all this. So, so when you see it, do you think that's a story? I think bingo. You know, I've, I've been at the paper for just over a year and I'm constantly looking for a front page. And I'm thinking, well, today, I'm the one giving you that fantastic story. As we say in the journalism, ring the bell. It's eight o'clock on Thursday, the 12th of July. The headlines, the Queen has stormed out of a photo shoot after being asked to take off her crown. Can I just show the picture yes. inside because you get to see the Queen's face here. That is a picture, isn't it? By the following morning, the story led the BBC's news on radio and TV and spread around the world like wildfire. The Royal Tantrum was a headline story on the front page of The Sun and just about everywhere else. But it wasn't until lunchtime that the truth came out. Good afternoon. The BBC has had to apologise to the Queen for wrongly implying that she stormed out of a royal photo shoot. They've also apologised to the photographer, Annie Leibovitz. A trailer released yesterday for a BBC documentary series... Nearly 24 hours after the story broke, the BBC had to admit that the Queen hadn't stormed out at all. In fact, as the continuation of the footage clearly shows, she had been on her way in. I mean, when did the Queen walk out of anything in a half? And, you know, and if you, someone shows you a bit of film in which that appears to happen, don't you say, hang on, this can't be right. Which was precisely the reaction over at Buckingham Palace. Unofficially, I'm told, uh, the Palace raised this with uh, the BBC yesterday after journalists began making calls following the BBC press conference at which the trailer was shown. The danger was clear, you know, reputationally. You make stupid mistakes on something like that and everybody thinks you've lost your marbles and the standards have gone. Queengate, as it quickly became known, was a near disaster for the BBC and its relationship with the Palace. Having caused such embarrassment to the Queen with the original trailer, and then failing to correct the story for fully 24 hours, the corporation was forced into damage limitation mode. Which spelt trouble for another big royal project for 2007, a 90-minute documentary for BBC One by award-winning director Kevin Sim. People's distress, people's hopes and dreams. Here was a fairy story that everybody wanted to work. It's an anniversary film, and a film that obviously a great deal of uh, uh, weight was being put upon it in the BBC. It had a very big budget. How here. much was it? Somewhere between three and four hundred thousand pounds for starters, for a documentary, not bad. And this documentary had a unique selling point. It would include video footage of Diana that had never been seen before in the UK. 
interviews that had been shot by Diana's voice coach during their private sessions in which she had spoken in the most candid terms about her life and the breakdown of her marriage to Prince Charles. All these recordings took place in Kensington Palace and um, by the end of it he had a considerable amount of taped interview with Diana, not terribly high quality technically, but in terms of actually giving you the key to Diana, the woman, these were dynamite. So, you got access to these tapes? Yeah. How much did that cost? We paid £70,000 for the use of those tapes. The documentary was in the final stages of editing when the Queengate scandal broke, at which point BBC executives decided that the potentially contentious Diana programme should be postponed. We were under the impression when it, when it was first postponed that it was going to be a relatively short postponement. When it began to look as if it was going to be a little longer before it was shown, um, we were told um, that, well, it's quite difficult because Prince Charles is 60, we've got exclusive access to a film with, with Charles and we don't really want to offend Charles at this particular juncture. Um, we don't want to do anything at all, for example, that might mean that he would pull out of a film which was about a special BBC accessed film on his 60th birthday. So... You were told that? That's what I was told, yeah. On one current project, his personal enthusiasm has left him seriously exposed. And so, while filming on Charles at 60, the passionate prince went ahead as planned. The Diana programme was further postponed. The following spring, BBC executives informed Kevin Sim that they had come to a final decision about his documentary. The news was later reported in the Daily Mail. Why do you think the BBC decided not to run it? I mean, initially, I think that they, the Queen Gate made it almost impossible to, to tell at that particular point. Finally, I think they just lost their nerve. To be honest, I think they just lost their nerve. We approached the BBC for a comment, but they said they could add nothing to what they had told the Daily Mail at the time which was that the material gathered for the programme added nothing to the story. The Mail article also said the BBC had spent £30,000 on the voice coach tapes, not £70,000, that the whole project only cost £100,000, not £400,000 plus, and in any event, the film couldn't be shown because it was never completed. So if the BBC were to suggest that the film was never in actual fact, finished or anywhere near it. The film could be transmitted tomorrow. It's finished. Diana's anniversary had passed without incident and without a potentially embarrassing documentary to deal with. All things considered, 2007 had turned into a rather good year for the royal family in their relationship with the media. The firm appeared to have the whip hand. <laughs> Meanwhile, Prince William, by now signed up to his traditional royal duty of a period of military service, was still managing to keep a remarkably low public profile. By going into the army, he was protected there by the, the solidarity of the military, if you like. When he was on a military base, no one could reach him, and he knew that, therefore, his movements and who he is seeing were pretty safe. And this continued for a long time, and in a way, I think it became sort of self-fulfilling, because he was delaying doing royal engagements because of his, his military activity, and that kept the press at bay. But as second in line to the throne, William had little choice but to expose some aspects of his private life to public view, albeit at arm's length and by agreement with an overwhelmingly compliant media. All the more compliant as the press was about to find itself back in the dock, literally. The phone hacking scandal had finally gone critical and the government had set up a wide-ranging inquiry to look into the culture, practices and ethics of the press to be chaired by a senior judge, Lord Justice Leveson which meant that the papers were very much on their best behaviour. But in the brave new world of the internet and the smartphone, no amount of protection from press intrusion will save you. If that is, you choose to invade your own privacy. August 2012, 
the party prince and friends had been enjoying a summer break in Las Vegas when they ran into a hen party. What started as hijinks in the swimming pool ended up as a game of strip billiards in Harry's hotel room, all captured on a handy camera phone. The pictures could be seen by anyone, anywhere in the world, at the click of a mouse. But the British press were wary. They'd all received letters from the Queen's solicitors, Harbottle and Lewis, reminding them of their obligation not to invade Harry's privacy. The pictures were sent in overnight from the States. First thought is, wow. The second thought is, can we? It became pretty clear in the first 24 hours that, that nobody in the UK was going to publish. Um, you've got to remember this was sort of almost immediately post-Levison. Uh, there was a pretty febrile atmosphere. We were already in the world where we were uh, thinking twice or three times. Levison has probably caused us to think the fourth time as well before doing things. So what did you make of the arguments that Harbottle and Lewis made about Prince Harry's privacy? Well, he's gone to a hotel room, he's invited strangers up there. He has breached his own privacy pretty much by doing that. And that, would, that ultimately became our view. Our headline was, here it is, here's the pictures you've already seen on the internet. So that there was an element of, you know, this is ridiculous. The vast majority of people had already seen them. Is it right that uh, print products should therefore not print them? I don't think it is. Once again, Harry had made the headlines for all the wrong reasons, and a tour of duty with his regiment in Afghanistan provided welcome respite. I don't believe there is any such thing as private life anymore. I'm not going to sit here and whinge. Um, everyone knows about Twitter and the internet and stuff like that. Um, every single uh, mobile phone has got a camera on it now. You can't move an inch without someone judging you. It's an unstoppable force. And then in September 2012, just a few weeks after Harry's adventures in Vegas, the unstoppable force popped up again, this time from abroad, when a French magazine, Closer, printed long-lens paparazzi photos of a sunbathing Duchess of Cambridge, topless. The result? Angry complaints from Kensington Palace and an injunction preventing further publication. But the old rules no longer apply. Once again, the pictures are out there on the internet. On the face of it, the Kate Topless photos were a classic piece of paparazzi intrusion. And indeed, the perpetrators are still awaiting trial in France. Trouble is, the new media genie is well and truly out of the bottle. Back in the world of controlled public events and traditional media, William, Kate and baby George are on their first major public engagement, last year's official visit to Australia and New Zealand. At first sight, it looks like William's people have got things pretty buttoned up. A series of carefully orchestrated and minutely controlled events are going very much to plan. OK, everyone just letting you know, so there's a little set of stairs is here. But on the ground, relations with some of the media are showing distinct signs of strain. On the corso, which is elevated, so you either choose to go on the corso or on the sand. So you need to choose up or down and then stay. And for hard-pressed UK reporters, it is proving difficult to make a news story out of what is essentially an extended photo opportunity. These are the first people I've ever covered, ever, who will not speak to me at all. And more than that, the people who represent them will brief me about their movements, about where I can go and where I stand, but they won't tell me anything about what these people think. Now that's weird. We play by their rules. Should we do that? I don't know. I'm uncomfortable about it. I'm, I'll be very honest about that. And although the Australian public have clearly taken to the royal couple, some in the local media are not so comfortable either. So we're going to get George on Yeah, I know. That's the main attraction. <laughs> the affection that William enjoys in Australia is because the Australian public genuinely believe that that affection is mutual. But journalists don't feel that way and don't feel that he feels that way about them. I think Australian journalists by and large, probably have the same experiences as journalists overseas, and he's very standoffish. They're not going to sit down and grant interviews. Their interviews are few and far between. 
I think a lot of journalists are actually charmed by William, but I think there is an acknowledgement that, that he's not quite the warm and fuzzy character that maybe some of the people lining up in the streets think he is. For all of his easygoing facade, uh, Prince William is obviously a very controlling character. But there was one moment of the trip that slipped, albeit briefly, out of the Prince's control. When William and Kate took a day off at Government House in Canberra, they were snapped by photographers with long lenses, and the pictures were published in some local papers and shown on TV. But this particular photo opportunity had not been planned and was not welcome. So all this comes out in Australia, and the Australians run it because there is no law of privacy in Australia. And the images were very nice because they were showing Kate doing row, row, row your boat on her knee, like any mother would. Now, we initially received a missive saying, this has happened, they've been photographed, we'd really appreciate it if you didn't run these images. So we all went, all right. And then as the minutes and hours passed, suddenly the message was coming through that the couple were actually very relaxed about the images. There was no legitimacy to stop these photographs either being taken or published. And what was clear to me is they realised, as the future King and Queen of Australia, you can't start laying down the law in another person's country where they don't get what you're even going on about. Having changed tack to say that the royal couple were very relaxed about the images and that there was no row, no issues and no concerns over their use, a potential falling out with the Australian media and even sections of the Australian public had been averted. But apparently still fearing a negative reaction from the palace, no UK media used the pictures. However, when we asked, we were assured that the Duke and Duchess really didn't have an issue with the pictures being used in the circumstances of a successful tour down under, and that no royal permission would have been needed to use them anyway. This is the first time the pictures have been published in the UK. I do countless interviews to Australia, to America, where they just don't understand why this self-censorship is going on in the UK. They regard the, the Fleet Street media that used to be seen as the sort of gun-ho, um, most ruthless media in the whole world, as this rather timid little pussycat. Pussycats may be. But on the face of it, still not people William would choose to engage with. Nevertheless, the media remains vital to the monarchy's public image and thereby its long-term future. I think there's concern in the wider royal household about William's insularity, if you like, and the way he's excluding the media in many ways. He doesn't want to interact with the press and broadcasters in the way that his father has done over the years. I think there is a concern that if this were to increase and to continue uh, o over the years to come, then it could be a problem for the royal family because, you know, it, it, we need to know. We, we, you know, we feed off them and, and they feed off our affection for them. And it, it's a two-way street. William's innate hostility to the press, which now um, people would sympathise with, that could rebound at a later date. You occasionally see photos of him where there's a kind of rictus of dislike on his face. You, you know that the dislike is created by the photographers and the press surrounding him, but the problem is, for him, that can just end up looking like somebody sort of haughty and entitled. And I think if he doesn't play along a little bit more, he may actually find a, there's a backlash that grows against him. But of course, William is currently second in line to the throne. His father is the heir, and as the Queen scales back her public duties, Prince Charles is taking on more. Each one of us is here because of the hope and the trust we place in the Commonwealth. However, the troublesome question of Charles's political activism in support of his favoured causes and interests has not gone away. Back in April 2005, the Guardian newspaper took advantage of the Freedom of Information Act to find out about Prince Charles's correspondence with government ministers over the previous seven months. The government vetoed the request, but was required to disclose how many notes there had been and to whom. 
The response to The Guardian made clear that he'd written 27 letters, or at least 27 letters had been passed between him and government ministers uh, to seven government departments. They included the Culture Department, the Northern Ireland Department, the Business Department, the Environment Department, uh, the Health Department and the Cabinet Office. So there's a whole range there across Whitehall. And what we also know is that these letters contain deeply held views um, of the Prince of Wales and that they were, um, they were personal views and strong views and that they were particularly frank in what they said to government ministers. Attorney General at the time, Dominic Grieve, couldn't have been plainer. In his statement, on behalf of the government opposing the release of the Prince's memos, he said, and I quote, It is highly important that he, that is the Prince of Wales, is not considered by the public to favour one political party or another. Any such perception would be seriously damaging to his role as future monarch because if he forfeits his position of political neutrality as heir to the throne, he cannot easily recover it when he is king. Having lost at the Court of Appeal, the government took the issue of the so-called spider memos to the Supreme Court, and judgment is due imminently. Meanwhile, as questions of succession come to dominate royal media relations, there are signs that the household and its press operations are increasingly divided about how to handle Prince Charles's public profile. At the beginning of last year, there was a great plan backed by Charles to amalgamate all the press offices under one roof. And within a, a few short weeks, the whole thing had fallen apart. He felt that there was an attempt to sort of confine what he was doing, perhaps to tone down some of his speeches, cut down on some of his charity work, which was something he wasn't prepared to do. So he withdrew his cooperation. You mean with an eye on succession? the household in general were trying to sort of prepare things for an easier transition. Yeah, that's exactly it. Sometime in the not too distant future, Charles will be crowned king. Are we going to have a monarch like his mother who has been scrupulous in keeping her views private for 60 years? We know nothing about the Queen's views, about virtually anything. Or are we going to have a monarch, King Charles, who wants the public to know what he thinks about the issues of the day. We don't really know yet, but the idea that he's suddenly going to shut up shop, I think forget about it. I think he, he'll want to continue to have a dialogue. The potential consequences for Prince Charles when he eventually does ascend to the throne are already being played out. It is, after all, Prince William, not his father, who will visit China this year as the Queen's representative. What Prince Charles faces as succession approaches, though, is a new media battle, not of the old tabloid paparazzi type, but over public scrutiny of his personal views and public acceptance of what will surely be a very different style of monarchy. Vision of heaven and a pudding so tasty it has to be eaten at breakfast. Italy unpacked tomorrow night at nine. But next, the Oscars, EastEnders Live and Yoga with Dogs. Charlie Brooker will have an opinion. It's his weekly wipe. <laughs>